we're getting back working on uh, sample exam one, 29 through 45. 39 asks us to, uh, <coughs> says the figure above shows the graph of the derivative of a polynomial function. And the question is, how many points of inflection does the graph of f have? So remember, we're looking at a picture of the derivative here. So points of inflection where it would be, candidates would be when the second derivative equals 0. So keep in mind, the second derivative of f would be the derivative of this graph. So when is the derivative equal to 0? Well, once would be right there, where the derivative equals 0. Another one would be right there. Another one there, another one there. So it would be four times when the graph of this has a derivative of 0 which would make the second derivative of f equal to 0 as well. And ultimately, remember, in order to be an inflection point, there has to be changes in concavity also. So the question is, uh, here, the second derivative goes from positive to negative. Okay. So remember, the second derivative is the derivative of this picture. Okay. So the derivative goes from positive to negative. So that means this would be 1. At this point, the derivative goes from negative back to positive, so yes. At this point, the derivative goes positive to negative. Again, yes. And then finally, over here, the derivative goes from negative to positive. So we do, in fact, have how many? Four inflection points. One, two, three, and four. Yeah. And four should have been letter E. Qu questions about number 39. <coughs> what else? 29 through 45. Thirty-eight. Uh, we have in thirty-eight. It says that f is an even function. We know that from zero to one of f of x dx is five. We know that uh, from zero to seven of f of x dx is equal to one. And our question is, uh, what is the area <coughs> from negative seven to negative one of f of x dx? All right. So. Keep in mind that uh, picture-wise, if I know that the area from 0 to 1 is 5, and I know the area from 0 to 7 is 1, what's that going to tell me about the area from 1 to 7? Keep in mind, if I go from 0 to 1, let's say, and this is a 5, just for argument's sake, just to draw a general picture, and I know from 1 to 7 that it's the total area is 1, then what does that got to be from 1 over to 7? I drew it too big, but ultimately this would have to be negative 4 then, wouldn't it? Okay. Make that sentence true? All right, so if that area from 1 to 7 of f of x dx is negative 4, because in order to make both of those true, this would have to be true. Okay. So what does that tell me about this then? Knowing that this is an even function, keeping in mind that even functions are symmetric about the y-axis, ultimately what would have to be the case over here? Wouldn't it have to be negative 4 also? Okay. And so therefore, it should be letter what? Letter B. <coughs> Questions on number 38. What else? 29 through 45. Thirty-four. We have uh, some values of uh, f and g and f prime and g prime, and ultimately it says that h of x is equal to f of g of x. So a very typical uh, chain rule problem here. You need to recognize that we have a composition here between f and g. So that means if we want to find the derivative of h, <coughs> we need to use the chain rule, which is the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the inside. So in uh, function notation, the derivative of a composition looks as such. And if we want to know h prime at 1, then we need f prime at g of 1 times g prime at 1. So working our way inside out here, what is this g of 1? Do we have information about g of 1 in the list? Three. It's 3. So we can replace that with 3. And then working on our derivatives, do we know the derivative of f at 3? How much? And do we know the derivative of g at 1? So therefore our answer here should be 15, should be letter B. That would do it. 
What else? Forty two gives us the uh, an amount <coughs> A of T of a certain item that's produced at a factory. So <coughs> our amount function here, four thousand plus forty eight, T minus three, four T minus three cubed. So this is our production equation. This gives us the uh, T is the hours. Um, since production began at 8 a.m. And our uh, A amount is just the amount of items that we've, we've uh, created. And the uh, question here says, at what time is the rate of production at its maximum? Right. So first of all, the question is, is this a rate function already? It's an amount function. So how are we going to get the rate function here that involves this? It's going to be a what? going to be a prime. So a prime here would be zero there. The derivative of 48t minus uh, <coughs> 144 is just going to be 48. And then the derivative of this part would be minus 12t minus 3 squared times the derivative of t minus 3, which is just 1. So ultimately that right there would be our derivative function. So this would give us our production rate function. And now the question though, if we read it carefully, it says at what, at what time is the rate of production a maximum? So ultimately, we want to maximize this function. So how do we maximize any function? We find it's what? We find it's derivative, and we set it equal to zero. Those are going to be our candidates. Okay? So that means that we ultimately need a double prime here, because uh, if we do negative 24 t minus 3 to the 1 times 1 again, <coughs> we'd get negative 24 t plus 72 would be our a double prime. And ultimately, we want to know when does that equal zero? We subtract and divide, we're going to get uh, 3 equals t. So at time 3, and just to double check here, let's, uh, let's take a look at our, again, our derivative here at 3. Just to check here, remember, this is the function that we're working with. This is the derivative, okay, or this, whatever version you want to work with. If I put something less than 3, like say 2, if I put a 2 in here, I'd get negative 48 plus 72, that would be positive. And if I put something bigger than 3 in here, like 4, I'd get uh, negative 96 plus 72. That'd be negative. And so what does that tell me here? Again, I'm looking at the second derivative because this is the derivative of the function we're dealing with. Okay. And what does that tell me then about 3? It goes from positive to negative at 3. Positive to negative makes a what? Makes a maximum. So we know we have a maximum there because of that. And so at time 3 is the answer. And so the question, though, says at what time? What time did the uh, whole operation start? 8 a.m., so therefore it should be what time? should be 11 a.m., which is letter C. Okay. Jeff? How are you supposed to know that the first function is an um, rate function? Because they told us it was an amount function. Oh. It'll always tell us what type of function it is. I mean, it says it's an amount over time, okay? and so ultimately it's not a rate. If it had been a rate function from the get-go, then we would only need to define one derivative here. Right? Okay? But they told us specifically it's an amount function. The amount after a certain time, okay, that's not a rate. Right? It would just be... You know, if we put in time, we'd get items. Okay. Right? Whereas if it was a rate function, if we put in time, we'd get something per something. Okay? So it's got to make sure we read carefully that what type of function we're starting out with. And if we know that, then we can you know, use whatever we need to from there. The derivative of the amount is a rate function? Is well, th think about why. If I, if I were to do A of T, if I were to draw a picture of that A of T function, which is in items is the Y value, and time, which is hours, is the X value, if I were to find the slope here, at any given point, wouldn't I be taking items and dividing it by hours, and wouldn't that give me items per hour? Oh, okay. Good questions. What else? Anything else on this one before we move along? Uh, number 45, we have another graph here, and the uh, graph gives us the, uh, <coughs> this is the graph of the derivative, it's not the graph of f, keep that in mind. And it says that f is a differentiable function on the closed interval 0 to 7. The graph of f is shown. We know that f of 2 is equal to 10. We have that information. And ultimately, we want to know which of the following best approximates the maximum value of f. Okay. Now, thinking about the picture that they gave us, 
knowing that the, uh, the, this is the picture of the derivative, <coughs> and here, here's the 1, 2, etc. Okay. After I pass the time 2 here, let's say that x is in time, it doesn't matter whether it's time or not, but either way, okay, from 2 on, what am I accumulating here as I get over here? I'm accumulating what? Positive, Positive area. So ultimately, what's that going to do to the values of f? They're going to get what? They're going to get bigger. Okay, once I get to this point, then the values are going to start becoming what? So the areas are going to be negative, but they're going to start getting smaller. So the maximum is going to occur right here then, isn't it, at this point? So ultimately, what do we need to figure out? We need to figure out how much area do we accumulate, essentially. A okay. couple ways to do that. In this problem, you could count the boxes in there and see what the area of each box is and just count the total area that you've accumulated and add that to your 10. Okay. So that would be one method. So if we go from 2 over to 6, we got just on the bottom row, we have 1, 2, 3, you know, and that last one is not a full box, but it's pretty close, right? The one that's right by six. So if we counted the full boxes, we'd have one, two, three, four, let's say five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. And adding up the rest of the you know, parts, you know, maybe we end up with eighteen or so boxes, eighteen, nineteen boxes roughly. Okay, each of those boxes though is a five by one, right? So a five by one would give us and say we said, just say for argument's sake, just say we said it was 20 boxes, so then we'd get 100 would be added to our 10, and we therefore would get 110 about. And the answer here is E, so that's approximately correct. Um, <coughs> the other thing that we could do here too is think about this. Okay, if I know that uh, if I know that at f of 2 I'm at 10, okay, then I could get an estimate for f of 3. Remember by taking the 10 that I was at and adding the derivative. Okay. So remember the derivative tells me how I'm changing at that point. So what's the derivative at 2? The derivative at 2 looks like it's 16, doesn't it? Okay. So that means that if I do what I'm at plus the derivative, that means that f of 3, I should be at about 26. Because okay. again, that derivative gives me an estimate of how things are changing at that point. I'm changing at a rate of 16 for 1. Right. So that means that Going from f of 2 to f of 3, I should add 16. I should go up about 16. Again, is it exact? Of course not. Okay? But <clears throat> if I want to do the same thing with f of 4, I'm at 26 already. And then what's my derivative at 4? The derivative at 4 looks like it's at 37, we'll say. So if we do 37, we're going to get uh, 63. And then f of 5, we're at 63. And we're going to add to that, what's the derivative at 5? The derivative at 5 is 25. Then we could get uh, 88. Okay. And then at f of 6, <coughs> we're at 88. Plus, what's the derivative at, at 6? Uh, actually, did I, I think I did one backwards, didn't I? Did I miss one? 33, thank you. So that's actually 4 or less, so that would be 59. So it would be 59. <coughs> and 25 would be... Uh, 84. Okay. All right. And <coughs> let's see. Make sure I got everything. Two was 16. F of three was like 20. Yeah, it was. Make sure I have the numbers in there right. So two was. Uh, we know f of two. We're at 10 already. So to estimate f of two, or to estimate f of three, we need the 10 that we already started with, plus the derivative at two. Okay, keep in mind this is the derivative at 2 here. Okay, so we always want to use the, to find f of 3, we need the y value at 2 that we're at plus the derivative. So remember, this would be f of 3, which was 33. That's the one we missed, isn't it? That's, that, that, we missed one. I knew we missed one somewhere. That wasn't right. So ultimately, f prime at 3, the derivative at 3 was about uh, 28, we'll say. So at that point, we should have been at uh, 54. And then <coughs> this one is, again, to get f of 5, we'd use f of 4, which is 54, plus f prime at 4. And f prime at 4, that's the 33. So we'd be at uh, 87 then. And then 87. And then again, this is f prime at 5 would be that one. f prime at 5 would be the 25. And if we had those together, we get 112. Okay. And ultimately, that would be the value at f of 6. So we got 112. 110, so the only answer that makes any sense here is the 110, okay, so either way. So again, if we have, if we know the derivative values, we can, we can always estimate the next y value by going previous y value plus the derivative at the previous x value, okay. So as again, ultimately, 
this behavior right here okay, is going to be the same as what the tangent line's behavior is. And remember, the tangent line is the derivative at that particular point. Okay. All right. Added up all the squares that were inside. Yep. And each square was worth five units, five square units. Counted about 20 of them. So remember, you can count all the whole squares, and then you just have to estimate how much is left with the partial squares. But we don't have a function, so there's nothing we can add that differentiate or anything like that. We just have to estimate that area. Um, is that another would another possibility to estimate that area from two to six? Would it be uh, would a trapezoidal rule be a possibility there? I mean, you can see the y values. So you could do trapezoidal rule there too, can you? Okay. Got a couple options to estimate that. So. But key issue besides actually estimating the area, the key issue is just making sure that we understand that the, that area under that curve is going to accumulate positive values for our function. How we find the actual areas, you know, we've got a variety of ways, but bottom line is make sure we <coughs> understand why we would even do that in the first place, and how that gives us the answer. What else? Okay. And 44, we got a population function. So 6,000 minus 5,500 e to the negative 0.159t. So this being our population function, time greater than zero here, time measured in years, the population will reach a limiting value as time goes on. During which year will the population reach half of this limiting value? Well, first of all, <coughs> knowing that the e function here, e has a negative power on it, which means if this time gets bigger, this e function is going to get what? It's going to get smaller. So it's ultimately that e function is going to go to zero. So ultimately at infinity, what is this function going to be? 6,000 minus? Zero, so what is that limiting value? 6,000. So the question is, when does it get to half of the limiting value? So ultimately, aren't we just solving this equation? True. So if we uh, subtract here, get negative 3,000, divide by the negative 5,500. We solve that equation, we'll subtract 6,000, divide by negative 5,500 to get that E alone, and take natural log of both sides. So ultimately, our, again, keep in mind, this would not be on the non-calculator problem, otherwise we'd have a pretty difficult time coming up with an answer for it, but ultimately we got natural log of 3,000 divided by 5,500, and divided by negative 1.5, 0.159. Three point eight one two would be our time, and ultimately the uh, question then is: uh, <coughs> during uh, during which year will the population reach half of its uh, <coughs> limiting value? So if it's three point eight one two, that would be during the third year or fourth year. Remember, if I got an answer between zero and one, that would be during the first year, wouldn't it? Yeah. And between one and two would be the second year. Two and three would be the third year. Three and four would be the fourth year. So it would actually be the fourth year here. So ultimately it would be C. Any questions on that one? What else? Forty-one. We got a function. This time it's cube root function. Cube root of x squared plus four x. And it says here that uh, <coughs> if g is the antiderivative of f such that g of five equals seven, find g of one. So if we want to find, we could uh, we could certainly find an antiderivative of that if it were possible. But in this case, if we tried to anti-differentiate this, our u substitution would give us two x plus four as the du. Okay, and that wouldn't be anything we could get rid of if we tried to anti-differentiate this. So the question is, what do we do for functions that we can't actually find an antiderivative for? We write an integral function for it. So we'd go from something to x, and we change the variable here to t, or whatever other letter you choose. So we write it like that. And then remember the key here for finding the antiderivative of this, this g of x function, is to take our initial condition, which is 5, 7. 
put 5 here and then plus 7 out here. So we just write an area function for it. If we can't find an actual antiderivative, we, this is an antiderivative. We can't find a function that doesn't involve an integral for it, but we can ultimately write the function because, again, if I put a 5 in here, that's going to give me 0 plus 7. That satisfies the initial condition. Okay? And this is an antiderivative for that function, even though it's not in a nice form. Still an antiderivative nonetheless. And ultimately, if we want to find g of 1, then ultimately, <coughs> what kind of problem is this? It's a calculator problem. Uh, is it squared? Oh, it's squared. No. Squared. Uh, not cubed. Squared. So t squared plus 4t is our argument under the radical. And ultimately, if we, uh, like I said, once you write that, it's a calculator problem, and if you uh, type it in there correctly, you should get uh, letter A, negative 3.882. And uh, 43, we have a <coughs> f, f prime and f double prime are all continuous for all real numbers, and f has the, fol the following properties. And ultimately, in uh, property 1, we know that, uh, that f is negative on 0 to uh, 6, and it's positive on 6 to infinity, so negative infinity to 6. It's negative, okay, which ultimately means that uh, as we go to 6 here, let's call that our 6 point, we know that it's negative and then it becomes positive, so in some manner. We know that the uh, f is increasing on uh, negative, or negative infinity to 8 and then decreasing on 8 to infinity, which ultimately means that at 8 we have a what? We've got some kind of flat spot here. We know it's going to be a maximum here because it's going to be increasing and then decreasing. Right? Okay, we also know that it's concave down on negative infinity to 10 concave up on 10 to infinity. So out here at 10, we have a change in concavity. So ultimately it's concave down until we get to this point, x equals 10, and then concave up after. So with that said, couldn't it, uh, could it be something like, say, and then once we get to 10, change concavity of some sort. And it, needs, it needs to stay positive, of course, like we said, right? Because after we get past 6, it's positive from then on out. So it can't ever cross the x-axis again. Okay. Maybe some kind of asymptote here, horizontal asymptote, maybe some sort of deal. But bottom line here is that it's negative before we get to 6. It's positive after. It's increasing when we get to 8, decreasing after. It's concave down all the way to 10. And let me move that over again. There's my 10. So here's our inflection point, if you will. Changes from concave down to concave up once we get to 10. So something like that, maybe. All right, so bottom line, if that's our general shape here, let's see if we can answer the question. It says, well, which of the following has the least numerical value? So f prime at 0, what's f prime at 0? Knowing that this has to stay concave down means that f prime at 0 is going to be what? Fairly positive. It's going up, isn't it? No. Over here, it'd be going up, wouldn't it? All right, how about f prime at 6? Still positive, but less than at 0, likely, right? Remember, we're looking for the least numerical value here. Keep that in mind. Second derivative at 4. At 4 here, we're going to be concave down. So the second derivative is going to be what? So there's your winner so far, right? How about uh, second derivative at 10? At 10, second derivative equals... Zero, that's our inflection point. Okay. And then second derivative at 12 is what? It's concave up, so it's positive, so therefore, where's the winner? Letter C. Uh, questions on that one? What else? 29 to 45. 